Aloha my kako. My name is Ali Andrews and welcome back to uh, the third installment of our new show, Energy Justice in Hawaii. Uh, today we have the honor of uh, talking to a community member and uh, a community leader uh, spearheading a project in uh, the energy justice realm. Her name is Dottie Kelly Paddock. Uh, and she is the president of the Haula Community Association, as well as the executive director of Hui O Haula. Um, and we are going to hear from her today about a community resiliency hub, a uh, community led project out in Haula. Um, so, Dottie, welcome. Welcome today. Um, can you start by uh, giving us a little bit of background? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how you got involved in the work that you are doing. Okay, I'm an educator. I was in the field uh, of disability studies for 40 years. And I uh, lived in Haula for the last 30 years. So I always worked all the time and traveled a great deal and promised myself that when I retired, this is what I would do. I would work with the community. And um, so since about 2009, I've uh, served on the neighborhood board and also worked very much with our Hotula Community Association. Amazing. Um, well, that is an amazing background and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this a community uh, resiliency hub. Um, and I think maybe uh, back up a little bit for those on the line who do not know what a resiliency hub is. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that is? And then maybe I'll ask you about how uh, the idea started and how we are. Well, a community resilience hub is many things to many people. Uh, the more I talk to people about a resilience hub, the more ideas uh, I learn about what is being implemented in many parts of the country and the world. And I believe a resilience hub really needs to reflect, first and foremost, the needs of the community that it serves. So that is why it's so very important to involve the community in every aspect of the planning for the resilience hub. Um, on the Big Island, a resilience hub might be one thing. On uh, Kauai, it might be another. And I've talked to people in all of those locations and many more. And I find that there are differences between every community and that is okay and that's to be expected. So our resilience hub in Haula, Haula is a very disadvantaged community in many ways. It's um, yeah. The homes are expected to uh, not withstand a category one. At least 85% of our homes are expected to be destroyed in a category one. So we are been told for many years by the state and the city that when we have a major event that affects this island, that we will be on our own for 30 days or more. And we are on one of the most at risk parts of Kamehameha Highway in the whole state with high erosion, sea level rise, stream sea level rise, as well as landslides, uh, very old infrastructure. The bridges are 80 to 90 years old. So we know that Cam Highway, our only way in and out of our communities will most likely be shut down. And I'm, I'm concerned about that as well as the rest of the community. We know that we have to be self-sustaining at that point. So we know that our resilience hub will have to provide shelter first and foremost. We have no shelter in this whole area of Kolaloa. That's about a 40 mile stretch between um, Waialua and Kaneohe. So we're right in sandwiched in between those two locations and not one shelter here. Why? It's because, well, 
where these communities are very close to the water and there's very little distance between the mountains and the ocean here. So most major buildings or schools are right along the ocean, <clears throat> excuse me. And so we, we know that we need a shelter, but we also need power, water, food, medical services and communication services. These will be our critical lifelines in an emergency. And we also want to be sure that we add a dialysis unit. There's not one dialysis unit on this side of the island. And many, many people will need that service or they will die. So it's pretty clear to us what the needs are. That is, that's amazing. That's amazing to recognize and, and also scary to recognize the, the vulnerability of, of parts of our island. Um, I'm curious, was there any um, event in particular that made uh, you and your community members aware of this need for resilience or kind of a, a growing understanding of, of yeah. climate change and its effects? I'm, I'm curious the backstory. There. I remember that like yesterday, really. It was a very um, powerful event. Actually, it was the tsunami in Japan in 2011, their earthquake made a tsunami. We all saw that tsunami uh, on TV in 2011. And I was serving on the neighborhood board then for Kolaloa. And a person from our community got up and he said, I'm concerned. I saw the tsunami on TV. What is our plan in Haula when we have a major disaster? What are we going to do? Do we have a plan? And um, I was fairly new to the neighborhood board and all my colleagues representing other communities there said, well, we have our plan. Um, Haula will have to get their own plan. And we took that seriously as well. Oh, gee, <laughs> we're working on our own here within Koalaloa. So we decided we would get a plan. And I, I lassoed the gentleman in the room who asked that question. He was a retired colonel. And I said, you know, you could really help out. We're going to have to do this. And he did for many, many years. He worked with the community. We created something called our help team, Haula Emergency Leadership Preparedness Team. And we have done a lot of things along the way. You know, we've gone through all kinds of trainings with Red Cross, Civil Defense way back then, that's what it was called. Um, University of Hawaii uh, did training with us, their national training center there, as well as um, FEMA has done training. So we've had a lot of training. We've done risk analysis. We know what we need and we feel certain about these things. Um, and along the way, I realized um, we needed to promote this and let everyone know. So we, through the neighborhood board, uh, submitted a resolution that was passed unanimously in 2014 to request the city to provide us some funding for a feasibility study, possibly an EA and design of a structure for, as, a, as a shelter. And um, unanimous, unanimously passed through our Koalaloa Neighborhood Board, but, and the funds were set aside in the budget, but the funds were never released. That's happened, happens a lot to us. Uh, the funds weren't released. And so we kept looking for money and support to get that to happen for many, many years, obviously. And when I, uh, heard Josh Stanbro uh, in a conference in 2018 talk about building resilience on the island and developing a resilience plan called OLA. I, I just grabbed him and I said, if you're going to do what you say you're going to do, then we want Haula to be part of that. We are a small rural coastal community and we need your support. So 
magically he did invite me to come and participate in that process. And it was an amazing process that they put together at the city level. We participated in numerous meetings. Interestingly, I found myself in a small working group of 30, and I was the only person at the table who was from a small rural remote community. So I'm not very shy. So I told them up front, I said, you're going to be hearing a lot from me in this meeting because I recognize I'm the only one at the table from a small remote community and rural community. And I, I'm gonna to have to speak for everybody from, from communities like mine. And so I did. And we were all asked to put proposals in. And our proposal was to have a resilience hub. By then I had learned um, the name that people were using. So instead of shelter, we decided to put in the terminology of resilience hub and our plan. And now in the OLA plan action 15, there's to be a network of resilience hubs around the island of Oahu. And the first one will be built in Ha'ula. That is amazing. Uh, what a journey from a, a single <laughs> question uh, that led into um, a series of events. And uh, um, I think something that you touched on uh, just a moment ago about uh, whose voices are in the room and whose voices are mm -hmm. leading the design of different physical facilities as well as processes and how we value and what we protect. I think uh, that's a, a, a theme throughout our conversations on this show in particular. I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about like, what does that look like to be a, a community led effort? What, who, who's on the, uh, the help uh, task force um, uh, group and, and kind of what does that decision making about how, how to proceed, what does that look like? Can you tell us more? For sure, our health team has about 10 different task force. One of them is on our resilience hub. And I actually lead that task force. And we've created a management team a few years ago, probably in 2017, where um, we, we at the time thought we had a state GIA to proceed with the EA and design and that fell through. So we ended up uh, running into COVID with our next application. So we um, soon found that we got a lot of support from the community and from experts from all over the world. We uh, are working with a resilient design architect from New York, and he's been working with us pro bono for three years and, and uh, a videographer and other people who jump on the team just to support and help us out. And that feels really good. And, but I know that we've got to get this done. We are working, of course, with the city and the state to put in what we call a FEMA grant, which is a new grant that FEMA has started. It's called Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities. It's exactly what we need. And FEMA will actually triple the local contribution for that grant. So if we can raise 5 million here in this state locally and commit that to this project, they triple that amount. They give us 15 million for this application. And of course we put in the five and that would be 20 million. Um, that might just do it. But what we've got to do is work really hard on this next application. In our, we actually had an application this past year but our state and city um, building codes were too low. We were actually on a FEMA blacklist. And that really was that we lost 30 points immediately just because that happened. And that was a real problem in getting funded. So we, we believe we'll do much better this year. And we are very, very hopeful that we can raise our local match 
so that we can get the full amount from FEMA that we need to really do a good job of this. We have 25,000 people in Koalaloa. This is not just for Haula, it's for the whole district. <clears throat> and in order to shelter 2,000 people, we need a big facility. And um, you have to have people spread out. You can't put 2,000 people in one room, obviously. So you have to have several spaces that will accommodate them. Absolutely. Um, that sounds like quite a challenging uh, design problem. Uh, and that's amazing that you have been able to uh, secure uh, advice and, and support from outside entities. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I would love to know just uh, from a personal perspective, I'm really curious about community design work and I just started to get into uh, the importance of what community input, what specific questions and considerations and new ideas that community members come up with that outside individuals, uh, no matter you know, how much training they might have in a formal sense, uh, 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 they can never really recreate that knowledge that is held locally within community members, particularly around this idea of like of emergencies and coming together and resilience like those are all things that depend on uh, knowing the social context and also the physical context in which these things are built. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about like I think I've heard that your design process is particularly community facing and engaging local members and I'm sure that's been hard during COVID but can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that design process itself? Yeah, um, you know, actually, we really started reaching out to the community since 2014 to get their ideas. We really um, accelerated that effort more recently but um, when we first started we went out to every community to their community association sat down with them and talked about what could this be you know and, and they provided a lot of really good input and even though that was many years ago uh, I collected that and I kept talking to those people who were most interested in that we also took the information to our neighborhood board and that really got the information out to a lot of people because uh, the meetings are on Olelo and so they're televised and more people can learn about that. So people constantly contacted us and, and gave input. People really were interested. And in November of 2020, we disseminated a lot of information that we were going to have a meeting and it was on Facebook and flyers and we walked around the streets and shared this as well as with the neighborhood board again and encouraged people to please come or be involved virtually. You know, this virtual thing was kind of new for all of us doing this, but by that time we had realized at our community center that we manage on behalf of the city and county of Honolulu um, that we needed to invest in big TV sets so we could do a lot of Zooming. And uh, we've really gotten our money's worth. And that meeting really taxed the whole system because every meeting room in our community center uh, had a big TV and we were able to Zoom the people in uh, who weren't comfortable, couldn't come for one reason or, our, or another. And so we had a total of about 100 community members and stakeholders. When I say stakeholder, I'm talking about uh, people who organizations are uh, agencies that have promised that they want to be involved in this firsthand, like Kahuku Medical Center uh, up the road from us. They will have a clinic, a medical clinic and dialysis unit in this facility, in this new resilience hub. And Windward Community College, the other way down the road towards Kaneohe, they've also said they want to run a satellite program there to work with our community and provide them with a lot more services than they're getting now. So there are Verizon, for instance, has signed on and they will be putting a Verizon tower at the building. So there are many major 
uh, companies or organizations that are coming on and are going to partner with us. And we're very excited about that. So um, the community is major in this whole design process and people showed up. Uh, we had people for four days uh, learning firsthand from experts about our major, our most major and terrifying kind of disaster might be a tsunami or a hurricane. And hurricanes can, both of those disasters can be terribly destructive. And so we wanted people to know what would happen really. And so people learned about that first and then they were asked to plan in what we call small talking circles. And we grouped people, uh, groups of say seven to 10 in a talking circle who would, with a facilitator to keep things rolling and uh, going around that talking circle, being sure that everybody had an opportunity to participate fully. And that talking circle worked together for most of the morning of the, of the two or four to four days. And then they came back as a group with a big layout and a plan for the whole site. So, the, and then they had a reporter from each group that would present to the larger group and tell us exactly what they wanted on the whole property. So it was not just the building, but um, also all the services and the types of support services like food, medical, communication, water, power, and and um, and how how we should you know look into the best technology possible for all of those things. Wow, that is an amazing uh, design process. That sounds. Uh like it would be really valuable to participate in as a community member. It sounds like there were lots of spaces to be heard and collaborate. And those small groups I really have found have been some of the most uh, generative in terms of like people getting to make plans. It sounds like you got a lot out of that process. But yeah, there were, there were a lot of um, people who were speaking from their heart, but also a lot of very uh, technical people who, you know, had had very specific ideas about what was needed, what was necessary, and um, Ilya Azarov, one of the facilitators of the architect from New York, was with us, and he uh, worked very hard on uh, ca capturing everything that was said in all of those groups, and we now have uh, an excellent report that um, has, has uh, uh, put all of that on paper so that we have it to reflect on as we actually do the design of the facility. So we can be sure that not only the facility, but the grounds include all the aspects of the needs of the community. That is amazing. Yeah, that documentation and, and not only having space to make your voice heard, but know that it is being uh, collected and will impact the design. Um, mm -hmm. That's equally important, that's amazing. The other exciting thing about that is we did reach out to youth as well, because we felt, we feel, we know that this building will be a building for a hundred years. It's really for our children and their children. And so we wanted youth involved in this effort so they could, one, think about their generation and, and the needs of their generation, as well as know that this is coming and remember when it does come, I was part of this and that was important. Uh, we, we have uh, a few more minutes with you, Dottie. If we have uh, any listeners uh, who want to ask Dottie a question, you can type really quickly to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, otherwise, uh, I get to ask all the questions, which is also fun. Um, uh, Dottie, I'm curious, you've mentioned a little bit about where you guys are at 
in the process now. It sounds like you have a design and you need to be applying for the potential funding. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an update on next steps? And then also, if you could share with us if there's any way that if our listeners have been inspired by uh, what you are telling us, is there any way we can support you in your amazing work? Well, yes, you could support us a lot. Um, first of all, we, since we have uh, almost a year uh, with our next application goes in uh, on the FEMA schedule is uh, January. Um, we want to make really good use of the time now. And one thing that has happened is um, the, the property where the resilience hub will be built is uh, owned by the state Department of Land and Natural Resources. They've given us a right of entry as of last September. And the community was uh, permitted to uh, work on the land to uh, it, remove invasive species. So this community has really come out with a lot of volunteers to do that. And it's amazing what a community do, can do. And they have uh, cleared all of the lowlands and we are now looking at um, some, um, need for more uh, technical instruction on the higher lands. We wanna be sure uh, that we do this right. And we don't wanna to remove too much from the hillsides. And we wanna be sure that we're not uh, creating more of a problem than a help. So we need some technical assistance uh, from arborists perhaps, our people, who are from botanical gardens to help us because we are wanting to remove most of the invasive species there, um, things that uh, are in the way. And we also plan long range to have agroforestry on this five acres. So not only the building, but we, we wanna grow our own food there and have a food hub for the communities here. And, um, and encourage people to eat and uh, fresh local foods and grow as much as possible themselves. So um, we also want to get the EA, uh, the environmental assessment and design work done. So we are encouraging the city to release some of the funding that they have already set aside for this process and go ahead and help us get this EA, the environmental assessment done. And some of the design work is also necessary to do that. We would like to use the most of the time uh, so that we are ready. And in our next application, we can say that these steps have been taken and we're this far along and it will make it a much stronger application. And I hope that we can do that. Um, there was a partial uh, environmental assessment done because this was a site where the city was going to put our new local fire station, but they ended up moving it to a new site, a different site. So we have the beginnings of an environmental assessment, and we believe we can build on that, and we would really like help to do that. That's amazing, Dottie. I'm sorry that I left you. Uh, my internet uh, is trouble this evening, but I'm uh, I'm back, and I'm sorry. Did you share with folks who are listening how they can get involved? Like, if there's a website or a um... there is a website, and you can go to our website. It's a brand new website, actually. It's called Hui H U I O Haula. So H-U-I-O-H-A-U-U-L-A dot org. So go there. There is a way that you can send me a message. Uh, if you want to make a contribution, a money contribution, that's great. If, you're, uh, if you know Mayor Bongiardi, you could talk to him <laughs> and ask him to help us release that money. Um, so there are all kinds of things you could do. Um, 
If you're an expert in any of these areas of uh, environmental design, uh, our, help us look at the site and figure out where we go next as a community because we've committed $120,000 worth of work to be done there. And we want to finish that up. We've done a lot. And, uh, but we could do some more, I think. And so we need some expert advice on, on the best steps to take from this point on. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Dobby. That sounds like an amazing opportunity to get involved. And thank you so much for joining us uh, today on energy justice in Hawaii. Your work is so important, not just bringing resiliency to uh, disadvantaged areas of our state, as well as bringing the community voice into that design process to make sure that project is the most effective one possible. Um, thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to uh, keeping uh, an eye out for when the Resiliency Hub uh, starts construction. That sounds exciting in the future. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk. I, I'm, I looked up your organization online and I'm excited about what you're doing. And I really want to learn what you're doing in Molokai and, and, uh, and find out more about what, what uh, kinds of services and, and Mana'o you can share as well. So we, we all thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Daddy. All right, we'll have you back on uh, in, a, in, in a little bit to hear more about your progress. Okay, thank you.